there was a young preacher named John the Baptist. A voice crying in the wilderness. He kept preaching. People kept coming. Talking about the Messiah. They would hear him saying over and over, There's coming one after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to loose. He'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost. I don't know that day when it happened what a great expectancy and how high had it, it had risen in the hearts of the people some were sleeping they didn't know that destiny was fulfilling and then suddenly as John stood preaching he saw a face in the crowd that he hadn't seen there before. Jesus. He lifted those arms and that voice and shouted to that crowd, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. Here he is. Here he is, people. You've been waiting a long time I must decrease, and he must increase. What a day when the Son of God was recognized. I don't know. The 90s has brought in a strange feeling of destiny to me. With only eight years of this 2,000 year dispensation he left and many things can happen during this time but there's a strange feeling in the air I see it here and there among some of God's people there's a great expectancy something is about to happen something great is about to happen and the coming of the Lord is upon us, even at the door. Today He's preparing us, or trying to prepare us for the faith that can make the rapture. Uh, you know, all the Israelites, and which is a type of it, they sat at midnight, the clothes intact and the shoes on their feet, the blood on the doorpost, and the little belongings in the bag. The suitcases were packed. They were ready. They were waiting. Because the command would go forth, arise, and march, leave Egypt forever. And when the death angel came, it didn't touch a single home that had the blood on the doorpost. Not a single home will fail to be visited on that great morning, the resurrection and the coming of Jesus that has the blood, water, and spirit. Blood, water, and spirit to make the rapture. He's working to prepare us, to get us ready for that moment. There's a few ministers awakening out of their slumber. You know, I have a feeling today, and I'm so happy for the visitor, Sister. Kim, glad to have you and the ladies here that's visiting and all of you that's going to help us at the camp meeting. I'll tell you some things after I read the scripture that happened yesterday morning to me in prayer. And I have not been the same. 
I never will be again since that moment. And whether I can convey it or get it across to you the way it came to me, I don't know. But uh, I was telling a visiting minister from the camp meeting yesterday going through, he grabbed his pen and he said, this is the most exciting thing. And he began to write. And every time I said a word, he'd write. And I'm reading here in uh, Genesis 6. Begin reading at 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping things and the fowls of the air. For it repented me that I have made them. Notice the word repent twice. Grieved. Grieved. And then a wonderful verse here of the eight, but Noah. But Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Yesterday morning after walking and meditating and thinking and praying, I thought of the world's problems. I thought of mine. That's natural. Sometimes we think we're the only one got any. I thought the whole world is full of problems. Every kingdom has its problems. Every nation, every church, and every family has their problems. We're living in a hurting world. But as I walked and I thought, the text hit me strong and hard. When God hurts. When God hurts. Who comforts Him? You say, does he hurt? He just got through telling you here. Grief means deep sorrow or mental distress, loss, remorse. Israel grieved him for 40 years. When God hurts, and oh, how that hit me and Troubled me and broke me. When I thought of him, he has the whole world as his problem. And he needs somebody to help him sometimes. He gets lonely too. He cries too. He has feelings too. You see, where love is, real love, if you lose, what you love? For those you love, there's horror. There's grief. There's heartache. Nobody has lost more 
that he's lost. And our thinking has always been, well, everybody needs help but God. We leave him out. He's big, powerful, all wisdom and all knowledge dwells within him. The creator of all things, he is self-sufficient. He needs nothing. How wrong we are. How wrong we are. I read also in Isaiah 53, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he grew up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form of commonness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And what did we do? We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we're healed. He had sorrows, but we didn't help him bear his. He had griefs, but as it were, we turned our faces from him, and he traveled the road Alone, and so alone. I read in Genesis 1 that God created the worlds and then He rested. Oh, you mean He needs rest? Maybe not the kind we need, but He rested on the seventh day. Now, but love, sins, and failures, the loss of love, sin, failures, can cause God not to rest. I'll prove it. Isaiah 62 and 1 for Zion and Jerusalem, I will not rest. I cannot rest as long as Jerusalem, the apple of my eye, is under attack. And Lamentation 2.18 said, Give thyself no rest. Let not the apple of thy eye uh, cease. No wonder the prophecy came to me, Brother Freeman, when you were in the room and Brother Buster, when the apple of his eye was in danger. Last year, the apple of his eye was in danger and a prophecy came to me. Pray. I need your help. The apple of my eye is in danger. I, I'm hurting. I'm grieved. I'm troubled. I need your help. Pray. Pray so I can be free, turned loose on the situation. 
Prayer turns God loose. And whenever Elijah prayed, he could turn God loose in full force. And that's why the fire fell. The river rolled back. And the chariot came from heaven to carry him away. He could pray. Amen. Now, sure God is love and wisdom and knowledge and power, but He has feelings. He can hurt. When He loses someone He loves, He hurts. How often we tell God, I'm hurting. Hosea said, God, I'm hurting. I lost my wife. She's gone. He said, I want you to understand, Hosea. You lost one, and I've lost three million. So my grief is three million times stronger than, more than yours, Hosea. Amen. We look at the few people lost around Menden, but he looks at six billion on earth. When he loses someone he loves, he hurts. When a father loses his son and he goes into a far country, he hurts. He hurts until... He comes back. He grieves. He wondered, Oh, where is my wandering boy tonight? Where? Where could he be? Now, you notice here that God repents. Not for sin. But there's something about love and mercy that makes him change after he said something. He can't stay with it. He said, Ephraim, get out. I ain't going to fool you no more. And then later he came back and said, Ephraim, I just can't let you go. My love will turn you loose, Ephraim. I it was just a moment of anger. I said something. I, my heart wouldn't let me do I have to change. That's God. Aren't you glad He's like that? There's three things so great about Him. To me, His love, His mercy, and His forgiveness. So outstanding. Such love that none of us know very much about. Such mercy we think we've shown a great act of mercy just because we forgive somebody that said a little something about us, against us. He can forgive so easy. He said, I didn't come to condemn this world. I came to save it. The woman he forgave an act of adultery could have said, you saw her low down, good for nothing prostitute. If you'll crawl for about three years, I might even talk to you. He didn't say it. He just said, I forgive you. Just don't do it anymore. That's all I ask. That amazes me. That really amazes me about His, his forgiveness. Now, as I said, He don't ever have to repent for sin because he's, that don't happen. But because of His love and His compassion, He has to sometime. Now, God wept in the Bible, and God hurt. He died of a broken heart. The nails didn't do it. The whipping on... And Pilate's hall didn't do it. He died of a broken heart. What broke his heart? What broke his heart? 
He came unto His own, and His own, His very own, received Him not. And they stood around the cross and they said, mockingly, He saved others. Save yourself and we'll believe. He came into His own. He was dying for His own. And He couldn't get in a word of encouragement. That was His family, but He didn't want them to see Him die and He sent them home. He was hurting. He was dying on an old rugged cross. And nobody was up there with their arms around his legs saying, Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. I'm standing with you. I'm going to be your friend. I'm going to help you. No. No. He was hurting. And nobody was that happy. Even the eternal spirit had to withdraw to let him die. He said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Alone, hurting, dying. Have you been hurting? You're probably not alone, though. There's somebody that likes you. There may be one in a hundred that don't, but the ninety-nine does. And they would pray with you if you were sick. They'd hold your hand and say, I love you. But he didn't have that. When God hurts, who comes to comfort him? Now, I read this and it thrilled my heart when he was ready to destroy the world. He had nobody at the moment. And then suddenly he heard a voice. Noah was probably somewhere offering up a sacrifice. The only man on earth doing it. Only one. And I hear him saying, God, I love you. Is there anything I can do for you? And God said, yeah, Noah, you can build an ark and save the human race. And Noah said, I'll do it. Yeah, he found one in the whole earth that would help him when he was hurting. Comfort him when he was hurting. He found somebody. He's still looking. Because I read once when he looked everywhere. He could find not one man to stand in the gap. Not one person could he find that would stand in the gap to keep away the judgments of God. All he needed was somebody to say, Wait a minute, Lord. Use me. I, I, what, what do you want me to do? All he needed was a good prayer. To save that generation. Abraham was a friend of God. God called him his friend. A friend that sticketh closer than a brother. A friend that still believed God. After 25 years of seemingly failure, he was still believing God. Standing on his word, God had to raise up a nation. He had to have a man. He had to have a woman. Because of the promise he made in the Garden of Eden. And Abraham 
was that man. And Sarah was that woman. A friend. God knew he could go. I know Abraham. I know what he'll do. I know. He'll command his children to do right. He's my friend. Oh yeah, he's my friend. I mentioned this once before, but I find another man, two more that I'll mention here, not many in the Bible that got in close to help God when he was hurting. David, the Bible said, was a man after God's own heart. And God loved David. He sang from his heart to God. He worshipped God. He danced out there in the rock bed when there wasn't nobody to look at him but God. He lifted his hands and he worshipped God out there when there was nobody to see it. He sang. He played his heart and he loved God. He'd have been doing that before a thousand people. Well, you know, all of this. But he was alone. He was alone when he fought the lion and the bear. Shouting and praising God. Standing by Him. Oh, how God loved David. But one day David failed. He sinned. And for a year, he didn't sing. He didn't pray. He didn't worship. He had sin in his life. He didn't feel like singing. He didn't feel like worshiping. Sin takes singing out of you and worship out of you. And God got lonely. I could hear him say it. Oh, I wish. I could hear David saying this morning, I've been so long. I miss him so much. I miss David so much. He was a man after my own heart. I don't know how I'm going to get along without this man. And he said, Nathan, go down there. Go down there and tell David. Talk to him. Uh-huh. I believe he'll repent. And sure enough, he did. And the next morning, you could see the Lord all smiles. David's worshiping. David singing again. And the angels fold their wings and back up. That's my man. But look what he done, the devil said. None of your business, devil. I forgive him. Get out of the way. I'll do what I want to around here. All you've ever done is hurt me, this man. He's comforted me when I hurt. I better stand by. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, you ever stop to think when you sort of get tired and weary and overworked and you don't pray anymore? Lord, it's been a long time since I, excuse the name, heard from Johnny or Sam or Bill. Uh, I sure would like to hear. Hear from him. I hope I haven't got too busy. I sort of need a little comfort this morning. I've been looking at the whole world and nations and watching the enemy prepare to destroy Israel and watch the enemy move in to just try to destroy my church. Millions of my saints have been martyred and here. I, I need a little help. Say, boy, why didn't God do something? Because it's it's a free world, and man's a free moral agent. That's why. And he bound himself to it, and he can't. That's why. 
But in John 21, John, the disciple whom God loved and was always leaning upon his breast, John was the only disciple that seemed to know when Jesus hurt. Amen. And he wasn't always there. He went to sleep when he needed him so bad. But anyway, the Bible said Jesus loved John because John got close to Jesus and leaned on him and whispered in his ear, You're the greatest, most wonderful I've ever known. I love you. So God's got troubles, huh? Yeah, I tell you, He has. He's got troubles in Israel. He's got troubles in His church. You ain't the only one who cries when somebody backslides. He does. I was talking to him one day about it. He said, what do you think about me? I miss... I miss him too. I hurt too. Oh, I'm seeing a new side of God. I saw it in a little bit, you know, foggy like that. God's got a lost world. He wept over Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. How oft would I have hovered over you as a hen hovers over a little chick, but you wouldn't let me. And that hurt. That grieved me. Because, you know, he purchased his church with his own blood. And it hurts him so bad for somebody to quit. Because he gave his blood to save them. You know, so we asked the question this morning, so what? can or how can I help God? How can I help God? How can I comfort Him? How can I find grace in His eyes to where He'd say, Go build. I'll be with you. How can I get close enough to call me his friend? Well, we begin with one thing. Give him your love, your undivided love, with all your spirit, soul, and body, and mind. Love him deep. Love Him with an everlasting love. A love that will never question. A love that trusts and holds on. When it looks like the answer will never come, you hold on. He needs our trust. Jesus, I know... You know, you're doing all things the best you can. I know you're working on this thing with all you've got. I have that faith in you. I trust you. I presented you. Here's the problem. And I trust you, Lord. I want you to know that I trust you. I don't understand a lot of things, but I trust you. He needs that comforting words because, you know, the whole world is saying, if there's a God, why don't He do something? And God is saying, if there's any faith, why don't they use it since that's the only way you can get to Me? You cannot find, scientists will never find God. In a test tube. Can't find him. 
Faith's the only thing that can find God. You cannot break through that invisible realm with mental wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Giving your body to be burned. Anything else, it takes faith to come into the presence of God. So that's why the world don't know. They say, and I don't believe there is a God. I've never seen Him. And yet they have. And didn't know it. When that little baby was born and lay in the arm, that first little breath of life, God at work. Amen. That love you have for your family and your children came from God. Who caused the mother to love her baby? They can so go so far in sin until they don't. But as long as they're anyways close to God, that's a sign that God is because the real mother still loves her baby. The real father still loves his baby. That's God at work. Yet... They don't seem to see that. Now, we need to worship. God needs our worship. And I want you to, I want you to understand worship is more than some people think just beat the altar and, and yell and holler and scream. You see a friend, you say, Hello there. And you're all smiles. How are you doing? It's so good to see you. That's the way you talk to God. Amen. That's the way David talked to Him. Yeah. He was right there. Worshiping. You know, we, we just seem to think just getting a monotone, just like that, you know. But worship is... You're thrilled. You're vibrating. Hello, Jesus. You're so wonderful. I remember when you struck a home run for me. And I'm still shouting because you run that home run for me. And I'm saved. All right. So, you make a home run for Him every once in a while, you know. And praising and honoring Him. Because He is an intelligent being. And He likes to come, for you to come into His presence like that. Oh, Lord, I love you. You're great. You're wonderful. You're everything. I want you to know that, Lord. That's the way I feel in my heart. I'm in love. Neglect wrecks more marriages. And they really don't know they're doing it sometimes. Neglect. To say, I love you. Amen. So often, women will say about her husband, great, big, strong man, a man don't need anything but food on the table. He don't need any words, I love you. He don't need to touch the pat on the back. Hang in there, boy, I believe in you. Oh, Yes. He's just a little boy growing up, that's all. He's still just a little boy. He needs those words too, as well as you know you need them. And he ought to know you need them. Amen. He needs our prayers. He is asking us to pray. Jesus commanded us to pray, Ask, and you shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened. For whosoever asketh shall receive. He that knocketh, it shall be open unto him. And then, this is a very important one. He needs... Our fellowship. 
Some people think, oh, God was just doing something whenever He made man, just like He threw the sun, moon, and stars out there. Knows them a name. Call them all by name. Every one of them stand at attention. The Bible said if He calls them, everything. But they're just dumb old planets. He wanted somebody he could fellowship. And he didn't make a bunch of dummies when he made mankind. He made them in his image. Somebody could really talk to him and he could talk back to them. Somebody they could sit down with and reason with. He said, come together and let us reason. You mean the Almighty God would do that? Would sit down with a human being and just say, let's reason this out. You tell me and I'll tell you. Yeah, that's fellowship. He longs for fellowship. He proved that. Every day he came down to see Adam and Eve. And in the cool of the day, he needed a little fellowship. And so they couldn't come up to where he was at, so he came down to where they was at. And when he got there, they had fellowship. And he longs for that today. He needs our fellowship. And I have been practicing occasionally. It's hard. You always got something you need. To walk into His presence. Hello, Jesus. Good morning. You're such a wonderful person. And I appreciate you. There's a million things I don't understand, but you're doing it right. You can't do wrong. There's not another person on earth could do it better than you. You know what you're doing. You know where we're going. And you know when we're going to get there. And I put myself totally into your hands. He likes that. That's comfort in the Lord. I know what they're saying out there, Lord. You ought to do something. But we know you have. We know you did something. We know you died on the cross for the whole world. Thank you for it, Lord. Thank you for it, Lord. Now that's helping the Lord when He hurts with all these voices screaming out, you know. And where is God? When all the six million poor Jews and I hate it so bad were killed, people are saying, Where? Where's God? Where's God? I tell you, he was in Pilate's Hall when they said, Crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and our children. That's where God was. And they was crucifying him. They killed him on an old rugged cross. Where's God? He died on the old rugged cross. That's where. He's always beat them to it. But they just blind and don't see it. So just you and me, Lord. I just want to listen to you talk. I just want to walk around with you and let you talk to me. Amen. Oh, just let me walk with you, Jesus. Let's sing. Oh, just let me walk with you, Jesus. Let's stand and sing it.
that if you receive this, it'll change your life. It'll change your walk with God. You are needed, or He would not have created you. You are needed, or He would not have received you into His church. He needs you, and you need Him. The two needs together in fellowship makes the most beautiful relationship that could ever be upon this planet Earth. Do you want to be that today? If so, if you can, just march down as many as can as we sing it. Oh, let me walk. I want to help. I want to be there when you need me, Lord. I want to be your friend. I want to be your builder. I want to be your faith child. Oh Lord, if you if you need anything, and I haven't been able to see your needs, would you please just talk to me, Jesus? Talk to me and let me know what you need. And let me know when you hurt, Lord, I'll be around to sing to you and comfort you. Sing it again. your pastor have needs if I ever needed my whole family you know you've always looked to me but now as I grow old I need you and I need this church and I need your prayers and the Lord is hurting because his church is not fully awake 
to her possibilities and the things she can do in the earth before he comes. Let it be said of us, we're going to awake and be what he wants us to be. Sing it one more time. Oh,